Okay, well, we can see most of you and hopefully you all can see us. Um, greetings, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Doug Shipman. I'm the director of the Windsor Historical Society and would like to welcome you to this evening's program uh, entitled Getting Tight in the Teens and Twenties. It's an entertaining exploration of one aspect of life in the 1920s Windsor on the cusp of prohibition. This program is one of a series intended to highlight life in Windsor at the time that Windsor Historical Society was founded in 1921 and to complement our newest exhibit entitled Windsor in 1921, The Paradox of Progress. We had originally planned to do this program in person last week to give people an opportunity to explore the exhibit while learning about the period's many libations. We shifted to tonight's virtual format in the interest of everyone's health and safety in view of the rising coronavirus levels across the state. And so shortly I'll introduce education and outreach manager, John Mooney, who's actually in the exhibit gallery um, using some of our eye-catching exhibit graphics as his backdrop. So the rest of you will have to wait until later this winter to visit in person or enjoy our upcoming virtual tour later this winter. In order to help you get the feel of the live program, we sent out the drinks list and ingredients with your program confirmation. So hope you all got that. Some of you may have taken the opportunity to prepare ingredients so you can make your own cocktails along with John. And if not, you'll at least have the list of ingredients for each drink that he'll talk about tonight. Before I introduce John, I just wanted to quickly mention a few tips that will enable you to enjoy this virtual Zoom program as fully as possible. First, you should all be aware that you have been muted upon entry into the program. This is so that no one's background noise or competing audio systems will interfere with other people's enjoyment. We all wanna be able to hear what John's gonna say. Please remain muted throughout the program until it's time for discussion and questions later in the program. When it's time for you to talk, most of you may unmute yourselves simply by pressing the space bar on your keypad. Hold it down while you talk and then release it when completed to allow yourself to talk and then allow John or others to respond. There's a few types of computers for which the space bar will not work for unmuting, unfortunately and you'll need to click on the blue unmute box in the upper right corner of your own picture. So just scroll your cursor up to your picture and click on the unmute box. When you're done talking though, please mute yourself again, just so we don't have lots of background noise coming into the, the program. In order to view the presentation most fully on your screen, if you haven't already, select the speaker view option in the upper right corner of your screen. By clicking on speaker view, it should expand the image of the speaker, which right now is me, but shortly will be John. Uh, and it will minimize the other images so that you can see what John is doing as clearly as possible because you won't want to miss any of the uh, ingredients that he's adding to each of these very interesting cocktails. We want to make this program as interactive and as close to the live version as possible. You're welcome to ask questions during the presentation and during the Q&A session at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, use the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. Uh, to access the raise hand function, you'll need to click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and then on raise hand, uh, or simply press the alt Y key to raise your hand. Sue Tate Porcaro is on the program as well and she will cue John that you have a question. And then John will invite you to ask your question live. You can also use uh, the chat function to ask questions, in which case Sue will read the questions to John and he can answer them. We'll probably group questions in key parts of the program uh, just to facilitate the program flow. So please be patient if we don't get to your question right away. So thank you again for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoy this entertaining program and that some of you may be mixing drinks along with John or at least enjoying one while you listen. Here's John. Thank you, Doug. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the program tonight. Uh, this is our second online drinks program. And without further ado, um, what I'm gonna be discussing with you tonight is the, what's, what's known as the golden era of cocktails. Um, and to, to talk about that, we really need to define what a cocktail is. So if you've ever been to one of our drinks programs before, we focused on mixed drinks from all sorts of eras, all the way back to the colonial era. And while mixed drinks have existed that long, they weren't always known as cocktails. Cocktails are really an invention of the 19th century. 
So prior to that, mixed drinks were usually served in large scale formats and think of a, like a, a punch at a party, that kind of thing. Um, they really developed out of the 18th century sling, which is defined as sugar, spirits, meaning liquor, water, and ice combined together. Pretty simple thing. Um, what a cocktail is, is basically the addition of bitters to that. So you have sugar, spirits, water, ice, and bitters. Um, and then all to further complicate things a little bit, technically a drink that only has two ingredients isn't really a cocktail, it's called a highball. So uh, just keep that in mind that a mixed drink and a cocktail are two different things. So some of the most recognized cocktails in the world today come out of this period called the golden era of cocktails from when they started calling them that in the 1860s or so, maybe a little earlier than that even, all the way through to 1920 when prohibition is enacted in Windsor, which is also when we have this exhibit that's surrounding me set up is all about that era when the Windsor Historical Society was originally founded about 100 years ago. Um, so most of these cocktails uh, from this golden era, uh, they, they consist of simple recipes which have really endured the test of time. That's why we know about some of the ones. That if you have the ingredients list, you've probably heard of something like an old fashioned before, and maybe you've had a few of them or a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, they, so the, these, uh, these drinks tend to lean a bit stronger. They don't have a focus on non-alcoholic mixers. Like you might uh, remember if, you, if you're in college, maybe they had uh, sodas and, and alcohol. That's not really what we're looking at with these drinks. They had all sorts of uh, more traditional ingredients like vermouth and, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. So until the 20th century, these weren't really uh, things that you would make at home. People were going out to bars and having professional bartenders make these uh, drinks for them. Um, the United States was rapidly urbanizing during the second half of the 19th century. And what was developing with that was the idea of the modern restaurant and also the modern um, drinking establishment. Before that you had taverns and, and places where people would stay overnight and get communal food and communal beverages like I was talking about with those punches. But, but as you have these uh, big cities developing like New York, Chicago, those places, there's social clubs in them. There's all sorts of upper class bars. And that's where these creative cocktails are coming out of. Um, one of the most famous bartenders of the era is actually uh, basically the godfather of, of bartending uh, is known as Jerry Thomas. In 1862, he published the first bartender's guide ever that I'm aware of. And it was called How to Mix Drinks or the Bon Vivant's Companion, which I, I really love that title and use the word Bon Vivant. I feel like we don't use that word enough these days. So he's, uh, as I said, he's considered to be the father of American cocktail culture and mixology. And he really uh, led this charge of like for the rest of the 19th century, people were just publishing tons of cocktail guides and hundreds and thousands of different types of cocktails. A lot of them aren't remembered. The good ones are for the most part. Um, some other common and still popular drinks of the era that we're not gonna be looking at tonight that you've definitely heard of though are the Manhattan, the daiquiri, the Negroni, and the martini. There's plenty of others too. And uh, just to point out one really cool one that I'm definitely not gonna be making tonight, but it's called uh, the Blue Blazer. This was Jerry Thomas's signature drink. And it's called the Blue Blazer because it's a flaming cocktail. And it's believed to be the first ever flaming cocktail. The recipe was that you took two mugs and you put uh, preheated boiling water into them to warm up the mugs. And then you took um, one of the mugs after you emptied them out of the boiling water and you filled it with very high proof scotch and just a couple ounces of boiling water, which is interesting to me because you want it to burn if you ignite it, which is the next step. And you really need high proof scotch, especially if you're adding water to it to make sure it does burn. And then Jerry Thomas, I guess, would take the two mugs and pass it between them, creating this like effect where the flame is like passing through the air. And then they blow it out, which is always a key thing to do when you have a flaming drink. Don't try to drink the drink while it's still burning. Many people have, it doesn't go well. And then uh, they would add a teaspoon of sugar and lemon to it after they blew out the flame. And uh, it sounds pretty good. It's, it's a lot of finesse and, and showing off. Uh, and that's, I'm not making it here tonight because I don't want to burn down the building and uh, I want to still have a job. But, um, but we are going to be making four uh, drinks that we have here. And uh, we'll go through them. I, I'm gonna, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the drink. Uh, in front of you. And I've measured everything out beforehand, these plastic cups, just because I don't want to make a mess everywhere. And I make it want to make it easy on myself. So if you're at home and you've picked maybe one of these drinks that was interesting to you, you can make it along with me. And then after we make it, I'm going to talk about the history 
of the drink um, a bit, and then we can ask, uh, that, that'd be the time for questions is after that. And I'll make it very clear that it's, it's time to you know, ask some questions if you have any, and we'll go through these and um, hopefully it'll be enjoyable. So I'm actually going to start the list. I, if you have the list in front of you, it lists the Martinez as first, but we're actually gonna start one below that uh, with the riled fashion. I, I decided to make a change there. And um, so this is probably one of the most common ones on here. So let's start with how to make it. So the first thing that you're gonna wanna do if you're being completely traditional is you're gonna to wanna to have the right type of glassware for each of these drinks. So for this one, you're gonna want a short, uh, sometimes known as an old fashioned glass, a tumbler. There, there's a few different names for this, but it's a short stout glass with a wide opening. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a sugar cube in it, which I've already done. And this is a pretty nice uh, big sugar cube here, which works well for this. You throw it in there. And then if you look at the ingredients, uh, the next thing on there is Angostura bitters. Uh, these are a big component of a lot of 19th century drinks. Uh, bitters were actually used medicinally uh, back then, which is kind of one of the things that the old fashioned was known for is originally being sort of this, uh, not, not just for enjoyment and social gatherings, but for a, a cure-all almost. Uh, they don't really do anything to cure any diseases that I know of, but what bitters do is they help your um, digestion go through. This is why people in Europe often drink aperitifs or digestifs, I guess over here too nowadays, but like, you know, uh, older Italian culture is a big thing. It's to get your digestion going before a meal and afterwards. And it, and it might help if you're, I don't know, sick and you, you can't use the bathroom or something like that. But that's kind of where the history of these bitters come from. There's plenty of different kinds. We've got a few different kinds here tonight, but Angostura bitters. So what you're gonna do, you open it up, you're going to try to soak the sugar cube. So you're just gonna give it a few drops in there. Shake it a little bit, put it back on. And then the next thing that you need is a very simple ingredient. It's just a little bit of water and you're just gonna get the sugar cube a little more wet so that you can muddle it easily. So I have my handy tool here, which is like the Swiss army knife of bartending. Um, don't necessarily recommend it. It's better to have a lot of different tools. I've had a little trouble with this, but um, it looks cool. So then you're gonna muddle the sugar cube and it helps to actually place it down. So I'm gonna do that. And you're just trying to break up the sugar cube and get the um, sugar to dissolve into the water and the bitters and have this here. Notice that we're, we're not using a, a shaker for this. It's really easy to make this just in a glass. All right. So, you know, you can muddle it. Some people go nuts and they say that you have to muddle it for like five minutes. I'm not in that school of thought, but um, all right. So now you need to add whiskey. So this is, we've decided to call this a riled fashion because that's what they would have been using in the 19th century. Uh, today, if you go to a bar, you might get rye because rye's kind of come back into fashion, but for a long time in the 20th century, uh, the default was bourbon. But back in the 19th century, rye was favored, uh, especially in cocktails. So I'm just gonna add this in because I've already measured it out. But if you're looking at it and you're wondering about 45 milliliters, that's about an ounce and a half of whiskey. So you add that in, very easy. And then you are just going to, or you can, you couldn't top this off with ice first, probably should have done that actually, but you're basically just gonna add ice on top. Give it a little shake, I'm gonna use my hand because I'm the only one drinking these anyway. All right. Now some people will say this is basically an old fashioned here and you shouldn't do anything else to it except stir it. But that's kind of boring. And um, frankly, I think you make the drink taste a little better and a lot of people do is by adding um, the, the, uh, the zest of either a lemon or an orange. I prefer orange and a maraschino cherry, which we have over here. And this is my, my preferred method of doing it. So once you got all that in there, you're pretty much done. It's a pretty simple drink. But this is the uh, granddaddy of all cocktails. That's why they call it the old fashioned. It was already called the old fashioned in the later part of the 19th century. So it is the very, very, very old fashioned. You can let it chill out for a second. The idea of having the ice in there, you actually do want it to dilute a bit and that's to make it uh, into a cocktail. You, know, you, you want it to mellow out a little bit or else you'd just be drinking straight whiskey. Let me try it out. It was pretty good. So um, yeah, so just to give you a little bit of the idea of some of the ingredients we use, we got 100% rye whiskey here. 
This is called Redemption Rides, a very well-reviewed one. I picked up a lot of the alcohol that we have here at one of the big box uh, alcohol stores uh, around Total Wine More. Uh, you can find a lot of stuff easily there if you're looking for specialty ingredients to make these cocktails. Sometimes it's hard to find them at a local liquor store, things like that. And then uh, another thing I do want to point out for ingredients is maraschino cherries. Go for the Luxardo ones if you really want good ones. A lot of them are made with uh, chemical processes and they're not made in the traditional manner. These Luxardo cherries are made traditionally. They cost a bit more than regular ones that you'll find at like uh, your grocery store, but they're totally worth it. And they're also great on ice cream or anything else. And they stay good. You just put them in a cabinet. You don't have to refrigerate them anything. They're preserved. All right. So now that we've made the old fashioned, and I talked a little bit about what it is already, but just to give you a little more of an idea about it, before it was called an old fashioned, it was sometimes known as a bittered sling. Like I was talking about before, cocktails really developed out of the idea of slings by adding bitters to them. So name makes sense. Um, <clears throat> originally, um, it didn't necessarily call for whiskey. One early recipe from uh, that 1862 bartender's guide I was telling you about uh, had a Holland gin instead, an old fashioned Holland gin cocktail which uh, had Holland gin, obviously, bitters, a lemon peel, and ice. Um, during the second half of the 19th century, it gained that moniker, the old fashioned, differentiated from all the other cocktails that were coming out during that period as people were getting really creative with things. Uh, the first printed mention of it is uh, outside of Bartender's Guides. It was in the uh, Chicago Daily Tribune in 1880. They uh, give a bunch of different origin stories for the drink. Um, for the contemporary version of it that's made with whiskey. Uh, it, it was thought to have been made maybe by James E. Pepper, a bartender at the Penn Dennis Club in Louisville, Kentucky is one um, thing. They probably would have been using bourbon there uh, because they're in Kentucky. <clears throat> in 1895, George Kapler's Modern American Drinks listed the old fashioned in its modern form as well. Uh, they included a piece of lemon peel, Many uh, modern variations even call for more fruit than this, like a whole slice of lemon. There's a bunch of different variations on all of these drinks. So in the early 20th century, you know, it was still rye, but as you went on, it became more of a bourbon based drink. And, uh, and then of course, in recent years, everybody's in the cocktails. That's why we're here tonight. It's all coming back around. So rye whiskey is popular again, a lot of bartending um, articles online, things will tell you, you gotta use rye whiskey. It gives it a more spicier note whereas Kentucky bourbon will give it a little bit of sweeter note. So that's the first drink. Uh, do we have any questions, anybody? Yeah. Uh, if you had to sugar, why don't you wow, um, tradition mostly. I mean, I mean, a sugar cube kind of, I, I think it's you want to break it down and, and really it's about the bitters. You're soaking the bitters into the sugar cube and then you really want to smash the sugar cube to release the the uh, flavors of the bitters. Now that sounds very unscientific um, and it probably is and a lot of bartending stuff is. I mean, maybe there's more to it than, than I think, but, um, but yeah, a lot of people, if, if you want a shortcut, they'll use simple syrup, which is really just sugar dissolved in water and they won't even do the sugar cube or they won't use granulated sugar, any of that. But the process, it's an art. There's, you know, it has a nice feel to it as you're making it. It brings you in touch with that history that we're all here for. Uh, Mm. So I, as I mentioned before, uh, I got all, most of this stuff at Total Wine More. They have like tons of supplies. Um, and if you're in a different area where they don't have those, any like big box liquor store, I'm sure like some boutique level ones that are smaller will have them too. Um, uh, just not around me. Uh, so I had to go the big box one. Uh, anybody, anybody else? All right. And remember, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. I prefer you do it in between, you know, each, each drink just to make it easier. But one more sip. That's good. I hope some of you guys made that at home. All right. So we're going to move on to the second drink that we got here. And this time we're actually going to be using a shaker. So this is going to look a lot more bartendery. <laughs> so this drink is called the Martinez. And um, just to start us off, this is basically widely regarded, though not proven to be, a predecessor to a much better known drink called the Martini. Um, so we're gonna start off here, uh, as, as we're gonna stir everything in uh, a shaker over ice. So we're actually gonna start off by adding ice to our shaker and then pouring ingredients in. Over there. All right, 
So you want a good amount of ice in your shaker. You're just trying to cool things down, dilute it a bit. If you're making one serving, you don't need like to go crazy with the ice. You can double these recipes too. If you have two people, you just put double the amount of ingredients in the shaker and you just strain it in each glass equally. It's pretty easy to do. All right, so let's start out with the ingredients. So we got 45 milliliters of London dry gin. Everything is just going in here with the ice. Then we've got 45 milliliters of sweet vermouth. That's a lot of vermouth for modern taste. This was a one-to-one -one proportion of gin and vermouth. You probably won't see that too much these days, but that was a lot more popular back then. Martinis tended to have a lot more vermouth. This is a bar spoon of maraschino liqueur. If you're wondering what a bar spoon is, it's a teaspoon. All right. And then two dashes of orange bitters. So like I was talking about, there's a lot of different bitters. And if you're looking for a place where you can get these, same place, I got them at Total Wine More. They have a lot of bitters there. There's a lot of companies that are pretty hip that have gotten back into the bitters game. So uh, if you went back 20 years, you probably couldn't find orange bitters a whole lot of places, but now you can. And uh, there's Peychaud's bitters, there's tons of bitters. So I just threw a couple dashes of that in there. And we're gonna hold off on the lemon till after, cause that's a garnish, but I'm gonna take out the spoon for stirring. So when it comes to drinks, whether to stir or shake, um, you really only wanna shake usually if you have citrus juice or some kind of fruit juice in the cocktail and that's to bruise up the juice. Generally, you wanna stir it. Famously in the movies for James Bond, uh, he asked for a, a martini, shaken, not stirred. But that's actually a misnomer like that they did for the movies for some reason. In the books, he gets a martini stirred, not shaken, because that's the way you're supposed to get a martini. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I'm not gonna judge anybody, but, uh, but like that's the traditional way to do it. So we gave it a good stir. Like I said before, a lot of people go crazy with stirs and things like that. So after stirring it, just pour it into a martini glass, cocktail glass. Makes a pretty good amount. Some of that ice might've melted, which you actually wanna dilute it. And that's about enough for me because I'm not gonna be drinking at all anyway. All right, and then just garnish the glass. I could have done this before I poured it in there too, but um, I was trying to get some lemon zest earlier, but I didn't have a really good tool to do it. So mine's a little messed up, but if you get a nice lemon twist, that'll be really good in it. So it's nice and cold because you used a shaker. Hopefully you have one at home. If you don't, it's always a good investment. If you're looking to get into home bartending, maybe next year when we can have a bunch of guests over again. Yeah, it's a pretty good drink. I've never actually had one of these before. It's not a drink that you'll find at a lot of bars and it, it tastes a lot better than I thought it would with all that vermouth in it. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about it in one of its earliest descriptions, um, O.H. Byron described the Martinez in his 1884 publication, The Modern Bartender, another one of those early bartender guides, as the same as the Manhattan, only you substitute gin for whiskey, which is true. The Manhattan is just, whiskey and um, sweet vermouth and, and a maraschino cherry. That's all it is. It's very similar to a martini in a lot of ways. So this is just a variation of both a martini and a Manhattan. Uh, various origin stories exist for it. Two competing stories list the drink as either having been invented by famous 19th century bartender, Jerry Thomas, who I keep mentioning over and over again in New York City, or alternatively a bartender known as Richelieu, a, a saloon in Martinez, California, and hence the name for the drink perhaps. A written recipe for the drink listed in 1887 in one of Jerry Thomas's guides had old Tom gin as the gin that you'd use in it, a glass of vermouth, two dashes of maraschino cherry and a dash of Boker's bitter. So there's a bunch of variations on this and you can still get old Tom gin, I think. There used to be a lot of different variations in gin. Nowadays, most people when they're drinking gin are drinking something like this. This is London dry gin. There used to be old Tom gin, there used to be Oh, I can't even remember the other styles, but they basically almost don't exist anymore. It's almost all London dry gin these days. We use beef eater. That's a pretty good one. Um, this drink also includes, a, which I kind of glossed over here, is a Luxardo um, maraschino liqueur. This is kind of a, a rare ingredient, uh, not used in a lot of drinks today. It's, it's made, it's the liqueur version of these maraschino cherries. It has kind of a funky taste on its own, but it's good in drinks. Sure, yeah, move these out of the way. All right, so, um, 
Some later uh, versions of the drink from the early decades of the 20th century traded out sweet vermouth for dry vermouth. There's a lot of experimentation with that early on. I think that by this point, we've gotten it right. So if you're looking at modern recipes, go with that in a lot of drinks. Um, but but it, this has worked out pretty good. It tastes very similar to a Manhattan in some ways. Um, by the 1920s, the modern version of the martini, if this is the origin to it, which I can't say for sure if it is, had overtaken this in popularity um, and featuring London dry gin and dry vermouth and became a common American cocktail by the mid 20th century. It's ubiquitous, you know, you see in the Mad Men TV show and everything, everybody is drinking them at that point. Not, not too much these days. Not many people are ordering martinis at bars anymore, I don't think, but, oh, sue us. But, um, and, and a lot of people do, a very good classy drink, but, you know, people, people have uh, gotten into some new stuff too. Do we have any questions about this one? And here's one more tip for you. I have these, um, these, these are my own um, cocktail glasses and they have an extended rim on it because it's very hard to hold one of these. The whole point of the cocktail glass is it opens up to like let out the, um, the, the, the smells that you wanna get off the cocktail and really get a, that uh, flavor and everything. But it's very hard to hold and walk around with at a bar. Try holding your palm on the bottom of it or also putting your pinky like to the base of the glass and your forefinger up to the top so that you can kind of put pressure and keep it right or else you're gonna spill it everywhere. Not that I've ever done that. But, um, but you might look a little weird holding it like this, but it's better than spilling the drink. Yes, oh, all right, so that question, if, if you didn't hear it was, is it incorrect to hold it by the glass bowl? And yeah, kind of is. So for the old fashioned, there's no stem, so you're gonna have to grab a bite. It's a pretty thick glass and it's got ice in it to help it stay cool. Drinks that don't have ice in them have a stem because you want to keep the drink cold while you're holding it. Same thing for wine. The stem is there for you to hold to keep your drink cold. So if it's got a stem, generally hold it. The only time that there's an exception is there's a really stubby stem on like schnifter glasses for uh, cognac. And then you're actually supposed to hold the cognac in your hand to warm it up for the flavor. Anybody else? Moving on. All right. So drink number three. This is another drink that we're making in a cocktail glass. This one's pretty um, visually interesting. It's called the Aviation. So we'll just start going through and then uh, I'll show you how to make it and then we can talk about it. So we're gonna add all ingredients into the cocktail shaker, which I've got a bunch of cocktail shakers here. So this is the one for this drink um, and filled with ice and then um, shake well. So, so this one actually includes lemon juice, which is when I was saying, you should shake the drink. It's always fun to shake the drink with like Tom Cruise and cocktail or something. So we're just gonna add everything in. So the ingredients in this one, you've got gin. That's uh, London dry gin, same kind of gin we were looking at before. Lemon juice, use fresh lemon juice, never use a bottle, it'll taste better. Maraschino liqueur, which we already talked about. And then the, the novelty ingredient for this drink is a bar spoon or a teaspoon of creme de violet, which is gonna give the drink a very interesting color. And I'll tell you a little bit about creme de violet afterwards. Make sure that the top of your shaker is on very well before you decide to shake or else you're going to make a mess. And then just shake away. Feel free to throw it in the air and flip it if you want. I'm not gonna do that. I've read things that say you have to give it a hundred shakes or something. I'm not gonna do that. It's fine with me. I like it the way it is. All right, and let's pour. So this one is coming out very lightly purple. I've never made this drink before. The idea of it is that the creme de violet, which I might've gone a little light on, is supposed to give it a blue hue but I don't think I put quite enough in to give it a fully blue hue. It's got like a tiny tint of purple that might not even show up on the screen. But I don't wanna mess up the drink, so I'm not gonna add any more. Now, there is a garnish for this, and it's maraschino cherry. Should make it look pretty nice too. Yeah, it's got a little light lavender. In person, it might be a, a better effect. It's very, very subtle. 
add a little more of the um, creme de violet if you want a little more color to it. But nice looking drink overall. Let's give it a, I've heard it's very botanical and it smells very botanical. Yeah, it's very floral. Ooh, so this drink's pretty um, different. Uh, the invention of the aviation, it was attributed to Hugo um, Enslin, who was the head bartender of the Hotel Wallach in New York City in the early 20th century. The recipe for the cocktail was first published in his recipe for mixed drinks. They had very exciting titles. I see why I like that guy's Bon Vivant. Everyone else is like, oh, it's bartender's guide or guide to mixed drinks. Got to add in like cool words like Bon Vivant. So um, the name of the drink obviously alludes to the early era of aviation. Um, this was invented in you know, the early 20th century when people were taking flight and everything. Uh, the name also alludes to using creme de violet, which is purple, and adding that to the other drinks kind of mellows it out to blue, which reminds people of the sky. Um, it's considered to be a variation on a drink called the gin sour. You probably had a whiskey sour maybe at some point in your life if you've been out to bars. Um, uh, but it uses maraschino liqueur as the sweetener rather than the uh, whiskey sour, gin sour, simple syrup, or sometimes this stuff called orgeat syrup, which is just a sugary syrup. Um, the drink is uh, distinctive due to the unique blue hue, as I was talking about. Uh, it's, it's relatively hard to get this, um, or it was at least. Uh, they had a few different kinds at the wine store I went to or the liquor store, but, um, but back in the day, you probably couldn't find this too often. In the 19th century, it might have been more available in the early 20th century when the drink was invented. But as the 20th century went on, a lot of later recipes for this drink got rid of the creme de violet. And if you get rid of the creme de violet, I don't really see the point of the drink, which is kind of why it fell out of favor with a lot of bartenders. And then around the early 20th century, it got really cool again. As everyone rediscovered these classic cocktails, all these bartenders started making it. And then what the bartenders found out is they really didn't like the flavors of it, which I, I'm like kind of halfway on it. It's all right. But uh, so then it, it, it kind of faded again. So now it's kind of passe, I guess, at least in like bartender subculture so from what it was in the early 20th century. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's this rather floral drink. Any questions about the... Um, the aviation. A maraschino, oh, oh, that's a tough question. Why do they call it a maraschino uh, cherry is the, is the question. Um, I do not know off the top of my head and I haven't looked it up, at least in, not in a long while. I did look it up one time. Um, they are made in Italy and there's a process uh, used to preserve them. They're, they're putting a lot of sugar and some alcohol, I think. And I'm guessing that the name maraschino probably has something to either do with the region in Italy where they're made or the process. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, balsamic vinegar of Modena or something. They always have names like that. So that's, that's a great question and uh, something I'll have to look up. Anything, anybody else have any questions? Actually, this is growing on me. This drink is getting better. I mean, I have had several sips of other drinks already which always makes the drink taste better. But yeah, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. All right. So we're gonna move right along to the last drink that we have here. And this drink's a little funny because it's, it's I, I threw like a, a curve on something that exists. So this is called a moonshine fizz. And back when uh, we were originally planning on doing this event in person, um, we we're, were, were wanting to talk about the, the era of 1920 and prohibition coming into effect and things and how they changed drinking culture. So really this is a gin fizz that I have substituted um, this very stereotypical looking bottle of moonshine, which is called Appalachian moonshine made in um, West Virginia. And it's made to look like, you know, the real moonshines that people were making in the 1920s. And the reason they were making moonshine is because you couldn't get a lot of liquor in a lot of places because of prohibition. And the gin fizz uh, is also a, a little bit of a different kind of drink. It did come out in the golden era of cocktails, so it would have existed already, but it has, uh, it has a different glass to it, first of all. This is a highball glass, or you can use a Collins glass. Collins glass is a little narrower and higher, but these high glasses that you're gonna fill with ice, which actually I'm gonna do right now. All right, so you wanna fill the whole entire glass with ice. I'm just going to use my hand because it'll be easier. Making a mess. 
There we go. And the shaker as well. All right. So this. The ingredients for this one, 45 milliliters of moonshine. If you can't find moonshine, uh, feel free to replace it with really any kind of hard alcohol that you prefer. Uh, there are plenty of variations on fizzes uh, using all sorts of different stuff. 30 uh, milliliters of fresh lemon juice. Always use fresh, as I was saying before. Uh, 10 milliliters of simple syrup. Uh, as I said before, if you've never heard of simple syrup before, all you need to do to make it yourself is you take one-to-one -one amounts of sugar and water, put them together, boil the water for a second, stir, sugar dissolves in, let it cool, you made simple syrup, congratulations. Um, all right, so you're gonna shake all ingredients with ice cubes in the shaker, because you have lemon juice in there. Except for the soda water, you don't wanna shake any carbonated ingredients. I think it's pretty obvious that you don't wanna shake carbonated ingredients, but I thought I'd say it just in case anyone had a question there. So, shake it up, pour it in the glass, over the ice. Now it says on this um, recipe here, which I got from the like, official international bartender's guide or whatever, top with soda water. What it means by top with soda water, or, or it says splash of soda water into the ingredients, is just really fill the rest of it up with soda water. And then with a drink like this, you can use lemon zest, but I'm gonna use like two slices of lemon because you really can use a bit more flavor in this kind of drink where you have a lot of carbonation and a lot of non-alcoholic drinks. So I have a stir rod, I don't know why I'm using that. So you can stir it a little to get the uh, carbonated soda water in a bit more. Very simple drink. You've got a fizz. It's called a fizz because of carbonation. Carb uh, that you've added seltzer water to it. By the way, um, when, when I say seltzer water, try to use seltzer. You can use club soda too. Club soda tends to have minerals and stuff in it. What you don't want to use is tonic water. Tonic water has quinine in it, which will change the flavor. It was originally put in tonic water to um, help prevent, I can't remember exactly what it helped prevent, but, but uh, the British used it in, in areas, I think it was malaria. I might be wrong on that, but, um, but the tonic was there for a health benefit. And then it actually led to the invention of the gin and tonic because the quinine in the tonic water interacts with the gin in an interesting way and makes it taste good. But don't use that in this drink, use seltzer. And it tastes good. It tastes like, um, you know, soda and, and liquor, <laughs> which is always good. So um, just to give you a little history on the fizzes, because uh, there's many of them, the 1887 edition of Jerry Thomas's Bartender's Guide includes six different recipes for fizzes with all sorts of different types of liquor in them. From 1900 to 1940, the fizz became widely popular throughout the United States. And that's one thing I really wanted to focus on for this whole thing, by the way, is all these drinks started in America. There were tons of drinks from this period that started in Europe, like all those Hemingway drinks, even though he, he's an American, uh, you know, they, they focused on European ingredients like absinthe and cognac and stuff, but these are pretty American some European ingredients, but, but American inventions. So uh, the fizz in particular is thought to be a specialty of New Orleans, um, a local specialty down there, even today. It's often equated with the Tom Collins, which essentially a, a gin fizz is a Tom Collins, basically. The only difference uh, between the two drinks is that the gin fizz doesn't specify the use of old Tom gin, which basically a Tom Collins doesn't anymore either. And the gin fizz sometimes includes egg whites. A Tom Collins was invented, uh, they believe, in England. So, you know, it just developed in two different places in the world. Um, the gin fizz is basically seen as an evolution of the gin sour, which just used gin, lemon juice, and sugar, basically a sling. So this just adds the carbonation there. Now, the reason that we added moonshine, like I was saying, is because of um, prohibition. And if you came to uh, one of our prohibition uh, we did a prohibition themed event a while back, and, and I want to talk a little bit about um, that. But before we do, does anybody have any questions about? Uh, slow gin? That, all right. So the question was in the 80s, you used to drink slow gin fizz, and that, that's a variation on this using slow gin. So if I remember correctly, slow gin is not a full like 
um, 80 proof liquor that's just liquor. Slow gin has a, a type of berry or something that they add into it to, to tone it down. It's, it's like, um, there's a lot of rums that are flavored and things. It's basically a flavored gin, I believe. And like I was saying before, there's Old Tom gin, which is a different, Plymouth gin is another type of gin. There were all these different kinds of gins and not so much these days, but slow, I believe it has some fruit flavor added to the gin. Any other questions? Oh, Nova Scotia, cool place, go there a lot. Um, yeah, so the question was, is, is moonshine widely available in Nova Scotia? And the, oh, during prohibition, oh, oh okay, good question. Because <laughs> I wasn't gonna be able to answer whether it is now, even though I've been there. But um, during prohibition, uh, what I know of Canada's prohibition is they, they did outlaw liquor at different points. While we had prohibition in the United States, I don't, all of, there were parts of Canada at least that didn't have prohibition. There may have been some places, but um, I can't speak for Nova Scotia directly. I'm sure that people were distilling alcohol there. I mean, people have been distilling alcohol places like for a long time, forever. I, I knew a guy once who had a still in his uh, apartment, but um could it, I make a comment about that? United States. Um, I should point that out. But, uh, but yeah, I can't really I, speak to Nova Scotia in the Prohibition era. Um, could I make I a comment a about that? Connecticut, but um, any other questions? Oh, could, could I make a comment about that? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear um, you. Actually, during Prohibition, um, up off the coast of Nova Scotia and um, Newfoundland, there was, there was some islands and... Um, they would bring the liquor, the scotch and whatever have you in from Europe. Uh, they had uh, warehouses along the docks. The warehouses are still there, like Al Capone. And they would bring the alcohol in from Europe. They would store it in these warehouses and then bring it across and bring it into the United States. And um, it's one of the places on my to-do list to get to, but uh, yeah, that was a, up in the Atlantic provinces was a stopping off point from bringing in alcohol during prohibition in the United States. Thank you for bringing it up. And that's a great point. That actually leads into some stuff I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much for uh, telling us that. Any, anybody else? Or, actually, I, kinda, I, I think I might move into, um, so, so just to tell you about, about a little bit more since we're already getting into it about temperance and prohibition. Um, this is a movement that started in the early 19th century heading forward. Our early temperance uh, was focused on the vices associated with distilled alcohol, all these horrible things in front of us that I just made. They really, uh, it, it was becoming more and more available in the early 19th century, at least in the United States. Uh, a lot of hard liquor, whiskey was becoming more popular, rum had been around for a while, but it was just uh, becoming more a part of society. And um, these people drank all day before that. They drank beer and wines and, and things like that, they, they fermented stuff. Then they switched over to drinking distilled alcohols. And if you drink that all day, it's gonna have a different effect than if you're drinking beer all day uh, is the point. And, and it's not a good effect. So the temperance movement really developed out of um, uh, uh, wariness about a family neglect, spousal abuse, chronic unemployment, all these things associated with alcoholism, which was becoming rampant in society where men were, were going to work and then they were coming home and they were just drinking all the time. And, and that's really what uh, created the impetus for this, this temperance movement. It really started um, in Litchfield, Connecticut, not very far from here. There, were, there was a pastor there who, um, who made a big sermon about uh, temperance and the need to stop drinking so heavily, excuse me. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then, and then it, it spread like wildfire, this sermon around the country and this temperance movement really kicked off with women throughout the United States and throughout Canada and, and uh, even other parts of the world where, where they really wanted to get people to cut down on drinking. And then eventually it just became a movement about stopping drinking uh, with, with the prohibition movement. Um, there, there were also elements of, of other, other parts to it where, where there was a worries about immigration throughout the 19th century. There was a large amounts of immigration. People brought their drinking cultures with them uh, anti-immigration sentiment was a part of the temperance movement. And they said, oh, look at these Irishmen, they're all alcoholics or Eastern Europeans, or all these people that are moving in that weren't the Anglo-Saxon white Protestants that had been here traditionally. So that is definitely plays a big role in it. Um, you had 
um, prohibitions on local basis. And in, I believe the first one was in Maine in the 1850s, they passed a, a prohibition uh, there. They, they undid all of these um, pretty quickly in that era. They were all repealed by the start of the Civil War. Many of them started to come back though in the second half of the 19th century. The Civil War put a little bit of a damper on the temperance movement because there are big things going on, but they got right back to it after the war ended. Um, the Anti-Saloon League was founded in Ohio in 1893. By 1895, it became the most powerful national prohibition lobby in the country. So their focus was on getting politicians in who would support prohibition. Now on the opposing side, you had all the beer makers who were becoming really big. Uh, Anheuser-Busch, things like that. They were all started in the late 19th century. German immigrants, uh, the biggest immigrant population in the United States in the late 19th century was Germans. And boy, did they like beer. Uh, so they brought all that in. They were fighting against the prohibitionists. It was a big thing going on. Um, as I was saying, xenophobia played into it. Uh, they got a big coalition together. Uh, and, it, and it really led to, the, in 1917, the 18th Amendment of the Constitution was passed. Um, and then that outlawed a liquor. Actually, a lot of the people who voted on it didn't really know what they were voting on. They thought it was gonna outlaw all the hard liquor, but then they were still gonna be able to drink beer and wine. Uh, then they found out that what they voted on wasn't that. It was a pretty confusing time. And you know the politicians maybe weren't doing their due diligence there, uh, but they were being influenced by these uh, huge lobbying groups for and against prohibition and things. And um, then along with the 18th amendment, they, they passed the Volstead Act, which was to enforce the 18th Amendment's prohibition on the sale of alcohol. So here in Connecticut, uh, it wasn't very popular. We uh, were one of the two states, I believe it was us and Rhode Island, who um, rejected the resolution to um, ratify the 18th Amendment. So we weren't really in favor of that whole no drinking thing. Um, and then it wasn't really that much enforced, at least by the state government in Connecticut. Now here in Windsor, they had passed a local ordinance for prohibition in 1917, around the time that the 18th Amendment was actually passed. It didn't go into effect till 1920, remember. So they weren't drinking here locally or they weren't drinking here legally locally. Um, so, so Windsor might've been a bit more conservative than other parts of the state. Um, now, as to what one of our viewers was talking about before with Canada and bringing in booze from uh, Europe. That was happening in Connecticut too. We're a shoreline state, which contributed to our wetness as they would call it in terms of how much liquor that was around. Um, there were boats that were just lining up at where the international waters line starts. And then they would have, you know, rum runners, they call them the little boats coming up to the shoreline. And at the base of the Connecticut river, there's actually a place in Old Saybrook known as the Castle Inn. And that was a big place for hosting parties in the prohibition era and for getting alcohol up the Connecticut River throughout the state. So yeah, you wouldn't really have a hard time finding a drink in Connecticut and it wouldn't be moonshine really. So this is a bit of a misnomer. I chose it because of you know, its relationship with the well-known ideas of prohibition. But in Connecticut, you were likely getting scotch and, and good stuff from Europe that wasn't you know, created in somebody's barn in the back. Um, so, so that's how, how when Connecticut, I know, like I was saying, Windsor is a bit more conservative. We actually have a picture in our gallery of, oh no, I think I, of, yeah, the local constable here in Windsor, his name was Maurice Kennedy. Uh, and he's got in the picture, if you ever come to our gallery, you can see it, it's just a ton of stills behind them. So they were actually going after people in Windsor and at least taking their stills away from them, if not arresting them. So this guy was, you know, a pretty big buzzkill for parties in the town, I guess. But um, yeah, so that's, that's really what was developing. As you had from uh, 1920, 1921, it was at the end of the year in 1920 that they passed prohibition. Drinking culture really transformed completely from this golden era of cocktails with all these bartenders putting out guides and making all these mixed drinks and things to the prohibition era where a ton of cocktails were invented too. And there was a huge drinking culture, but it was all illicit. And you had, of course, all the mafia and everything involved in any kind of black market. Uh, which you had because you couldn't buy the alcohol from stores anymore. Of course, you could still drink alcohol. And a lot of places like the Yale Club in New York City, they stockpiled alcohol before the law went into effect. And they had enough alcohol to serve their guests through the entire era of prohibition, which was 14 years. So they, they just, if you, if you had money, you didn't have a problem. You'd just buy a bunch of alcohol beforehand. You could also get medical prescriptions for whiskey. There were all sorts of ways around it. It, it was... Uh, 
yeah, it didn't really stop people from drinking. It may have stopped people from drinking as much as they did before. There is some evidence that people have never gone back to drinking just quite as much as they did before, except maybe till this year when everybody's sitting at home and doesn't have anything else to do. We might be doing it again. I don't know. But um, yeah, so um, that's pretty much all that I have here for you tonight. I have four drinks in front of me now, but uh, I'm just one guy, so I'm not going to drink them all. Uh, kind of a bummer. But um, yeah, so I want to thank you all for coming out to the second virtual drinks event. Do we have any uh, questions at the end? No. Yep. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I unmuted myself. I, I'll give you another little antidote. Um, not that my family were alcoholics. Um, the French Canadians, of course, were perhaps bringing some across the border, but um, my uncle was a, on the, a detective on the Harford police force and he was on the vice squad and uh, his sisters, <laughs> my mother being one of them, but she was really too young. It was her two, her three older sisters. Uh, they would go out in the evening, like on a Friday evening to a place called the Bucket of Blood. Oh. And, and I never got the real name of the place uh, out of them, but they would check with their brother <laughs> to see if there were any raids on for that night. And so there used to be like a roving places where people could drink and they, um, they would check with their brother to see what he was up to that evening before they would decide which club they wanted to go to. So um, it must have been pretty loose in Hartford. I don't think. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I would expect it, it was. I mean, I've read about they I think they had hundreds of bars in like New Haven and Hartford pre-prohibition. So it's not like you're really going to cut down all that culture and uh, and, and pastime that people had gotten used to overnight. I mean, I think it really says something that we didn't even ratify it. I mean, I don't know what Rhode Island was up to, but we were certainly drinking. And then of course, Hugh Blind brought in the, the mixed cocktail um, as part of a thing where, you know, people didn't have to mix their own after that. Um, yeah, pre-mixed, yeah. Yeah, so they had pre-mixed cocktails um, at Hugh Blind. Yeah, I'm a big fan of mixing them myself, but yeah. You know, when when in well, need, premix yeah, is pretty good too. Drinker, so uh, none of these mixtures would appeal to me. I just <laughs> go right to the scotch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do you have any other questions? Thank you. Was that it? Oh. All right. Well, um, again, thank you all for tuning in. Um, uh, the society is temporarily closed for, for the moment, but um, once we reopen, it would be great uh, for yeah, any of you who want a chance to see this exhibit, please come in person. It's free. You can see it. It's, it's got a lot of pictures of Windsor from the era and a lot of information on how the town was changing, and it was changing in a rapid way. Um, and we're going to have some more online events, too, coming up, so stay tuned. And um, yeah, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. How long is that going to run, that exhibit? The exhibit um, until early That'll, fall, at least. So for quite a while. Through August. Through, through August. August. All right, Doug knows. OK, I, I'm in California. I need to get myself out of California first. OK, thanks. Well, yeah, try and make it out. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything? All right, I think we're going to log off now. So have a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers.